Hey everyone, uh, we're just going to get started with the case study roundtable. Um, and so we've got uh, four end user clients uh, here to talk about their implementations of Civi and to answer any questions uh, from the floor. So the format for this is to give everybody, uh, I'm supposed to keep you down to about five or six minutes each, uh, just to give a brief introduction about yourselves, your organisations and uh, what you've been up to with Civi. Um, and then we'll, we'll throw it out to the floor basically just to get any of your questions answered. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Adam, are you going to... Yeah. Uh, right. Okay, so uh, we, my organisation is called the Institution of Environmental Sciences. We're a professional body um, with around two and a half thousand members. Um, we started using the city about five years ago, at the time we had about 600 members. And uh, this might look familiar to some of you. Um, with a modern database system, it's an Excel uh, database, and that's what we were using at the time. Um, and it had all sorts of problems with it. Um, things like if a member rang up with the name Smith, you had to scroll through 25 Smiths before you found the right one. Um, and ultimately, we wanted our website, to, our database, to be able to interact with our website. So we started looking around for for various options. And um, at the time, the organisation didn't have a huge amount of money, so we looked at a few Microsoft systems, and they were far too expensive for us. Uh, we looked at some proprietary systems, and again, the development costs around it were too much. So uh, we came across Civi, um, and we quite like the open source model. It chimes well with what my own organisation does in terms of open data and open access. Um, so we went about setting that up as our database. Uh, I do have some slides, but I'm trying to get a recording to work. No, no, we don't need to do that. Oh, we don't need to. Ah, right, okay, sorry. Yeah, I'll start being a bit more than that. Sorry, but it'll be all right. Okay. Still take the time. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, we're going to have to do that. Um, so, one of the major challenges of Civi is that it uh, uh, only interacts with certain um, content management systems. So, uh, we had to rebuild our website, which was well overdue a rebuild anyway, as you can see. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, we, we, we rebuilt our website in Drupal. Uh, fortunately, again, we didn't have any money to do it, so we did it in house. Um, we don't have any developers, we don't have any IT staff. So uh, ours is always quite an interesting story about uh, self-learning, really. Um, so we built a Drupal website, and then we learned so much doing it that we completely rebuilt it the next year. Um, and we got very enthusiastic about uh, Drupal as a tool, um, and spent a lot of our energy doing that. And actually, you know, Civi was existing on its own in its own, own area. We didn't do a huge amount of development. Um, and then around two years ago, we came back to it and said, okay, you know, the original goal of this was to get it integrated as a website. So let's, let's look at that. Um, and that's where Jamie came in. Um, what we wanted to do is uh, to be able to, we've got lots of different levels of membership. We wanted our members to be able to renew um, and to, uh, we have lots of qualifications on top of their membership. So uh, we wanted them to be able to log in and pay for all their memberships at the same time. We want to be able to select what membership they, they have, what qualifications they have, because they're all competency-based. They have to go through huge amounts of work to actually get them in the first place, so you don't want new users choosing them. Uh, so we had to kind of lock down certain parts of the system, and then also make sure that um, uh, it added up a total for us. Um, it's then kind of paid for through the website, and then it updates all their memberships. Uh, so that was the first kind of proprietary piece of work we did, uh, where we kind of developed, developed Civi in our own way, rather than using the out-of-the-box uh, model. Maybe you should go into the next one. Um, very much our work has been around minimising the administrative burden. Um, I don't employ anyone in my office with anything less than a master's degree, so uh, they don't actually like doing administration. So uh, the purpose of this was uh, was to kind of take a lot of the administrative burden off the office staff, you know, checking memberships, loading up memberships, you know, taking payments every year, and 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 and, and get that automated to as, as large a large degree as possible. 
Um, we also wanted to improve the membership experience. We've got members all around the world. Previously, when they had to ring up the office and pay for their membership, you know, there's issues with international calling, time zones, etc. So it's nice to have a 24-hour service around that. Um, and also, something that's kind of developed as we've been doing the project is uh, the ability to kind of know more about our members and their needs. So uh, membership segmentation is a very important thing for most membership bodies. Um, and so we've been building elements into that database to tell us a little bit more about those members so we can send them out much more targeted mailing. Uh, this one, thank you. Uh, so this is what our membership, base, uh, our membership area looks like. So members can log in, change their own details, you know, again, saving us time and administration. Once a year we send them out a little email that says, you know, this is the details we have for you. Uh, can you check them if they're not right? Can you update them? Um, they could check and uh, renew their own membership, uh, manage their own their subscriptions to the various newsletters and journals that we publish. Um, and this is something that we've been working on a little bit, and that's just gathering more data about it. Uh, the most recent thing that we're working on is a CPD recording tool. Um, hopefully we'll be delivering it in the next couple of weeks. There was actually a, a, a silly extension out there for it, um, but it didn't quite fit our purposes. So, um, uh, so James has been helping us develop it a bit, and we'll be donating that back to the community when it's finished. Um, CPD is continuous professional development. Each of our members need to do a certain amount of it a year, and again, a huge amount of administration in chasing up people who haven't done it, chasing up people who haven't sent it in, and sending it to auditing panels to, to, to look at the content of it. And so, to a large extent, this, this system again is automating a lot of that, that procedure for us. Um, I think that's about it for me. Oh yeah, maybe a little bit more. I've got one final slide. Uh, oh, two actually, I keep counting. Um, uh, another thing that we're very much trying to work around is, you know, we've been quite successful in integrating food with Civi. Uh, it's quite successful for us, but we also would like a bit more to integrate our accounting system within that. So, you know, that's the final stage of the administrative burden that we want to get rid of. Um, I think actually I'll just end there, James. Thank you. I think I've had my time. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, so, this is my name. Uh, well, actually, this is a bit of a mistake, actually. It's called volunteer. What we should actually read is, I'm a prisoner, please send help. <laughs> so, uh, I'm a volunteer for the CPA, the Association of Terrors, uh, and I've been working on the project for about the last six months. Uh, what I'd like to do is set a bit of context for you to give you an idea about what the Association of Terrors is about and indeed a bit about my background so that when you ask me questions you'll get an idea about where I'm coming from. Uh, couple more okay. uh, so the Association of Terrors is actually a very young organisation. It was set up less than a year ago. Um, most people find the, the title of Association of Terrors quite amusing. I imagine it's the answer to the arrangement of furniture or something. Uh, but it's actually about supporting uh, chairs of charitable organisations, so that's charities, CICs, and all other non, sorry, other charitable organisations. Um, it's to provide resources, basically, and uh, events uh, to support those chairs. So, for example, um, the Association of Chairs has been recently running events with. Uh, Faith-based organisations, so we've had the ex-Archbishop uh, of Canterbury to come along and actually talk about um, religion in a secular community. Uh, we've had uh, experts in to talk to them about um, setting up uh, charities. Um, so we'll have experts, for example, in the future to talk about fraud within charities and a whole host, basically, of things that should be of interest to uh, charitable organisations. Um, this is a bad bit of volunteer history is that, the, it, that if you do have uh, contact with your chair in your organisation, I think the Association of Chairs is actually a, a very good organisation to be uh, associated with. Uh, lots of the events are actually free, so please do tell your chairs about it. Uh, there's lots of useful information. There will be an event uh, at the Lord Mayor's uh, show next, uh, next month to launch the Guide for Chairs. Uh, it's going to be a free paper, basically, so lots of, there's lots and lots of free benefits to be had from coming to the events of the Association of Charities. You don't need to be a member, uh, so I do encourage you to sort of look into it further. So that's 
also the lecture which you can choose. This bit invites me, because if you ask me a question, you might wonder where I'm coming from. This is a question for you, really. This is a calibration question. So with a glass here, oh, it's a vodka, I guess it's bad. This is a glass half full of water or half empty. It depends upon how you look at it. Uh, I've got a question for you in terms of how you see me. Do you see me as a half empty glass person or a half full glass person? So who thinks it's half full in terms of me? Would I say this was half full? Right. And how many people think I would be a half empty type person? <laughs> I see there's a very astute man over there. <laughs> I'm a half empty person. I make the problem. In fact, not only is this glass half empty to me, I worry about the evaporation rate of the glass. <laughs> So when you're asking me a question, I'm actually going to be very uh, negative and critical. So you need to bear that in mind in terms of the answers I'm likely to supply you with. <laughs> now, my background is, is a terrible pun. That, that, does anybody know what this pun is about? When I, my background is programming. Many, many years ago, I was a programmer. And I managed to escape all of that and move into systems analysis and then into business analysis and business consulting. There's a terrible pun on Windows. <laughs> when I started programming, uh, I actually started programming on bits of cardboard when I was at university. Believe it or not, that did actually happen. In my day, when I started programming, this is what Windows actually meant. I, I predate Windows, and this is an apple. So this apple was something you ate, not something you typed on. I don't know anything about HTML, CSC, and not JavaScript, and all the other nice acronyms. I will have had to learn some of that stuff along the way. So that's a bit about me. So when you ask me questions, I do have an IT background, but it's very, very old. Okay. Now, the project. This is our project. <laughs> now, this is a rather bleak picture. <laughs> and it also sort of gives you a slightly distorted view of what the association shares is like. Out another window of the association of shares is actually a very busy building site. The foundations have gone in. Uh, the walls are going up, so funding, events have been cancelled in for next year. There's lots and lots of activity taking place on the main uh, charity activities. So the trustees have been extremely busy in that end of the road. However, IT is not a huge priority to uh, the project. So in this sort of resource-free environment that you're seeing here, uh, that's the sort of landscape we're actually dwelling in. About six months ago, we were in an oasis with uh, Jamie and Country Corp. And I would like to publicly thank actually Jamie and Comfort Court for the amount of discretionary effort they've actually put in to help us get, well, not into the middle of the desert, but <laughs> to make progress. Our budget uh, up here is a pawning, so that gives you an idea of the actual sort of budget we're working to. Uh, because IT is such a, uh, it's not a priority, and there is very little uh, monthly uh, backing to actually make any changes. As far as what we've actually got at the moment, we're on a WordPress site. Uh, we've been assessing uh, moving to City CRM for the last six months, and we will probably continue making that assessment uh, until the board make a decision about whether we want to move, take the risks basically involved of moving to the uh, City CRM environment. So I just want you to bear in mind that's the background I'm coming from in terms of any questions that I might be answering. Uh, no greater background in IT than that, really. <laughs> so, coming from the same page. Um, so, I'm Matt Winyard. I work for the Royal, the Royal National Institute of Buying People. Um, so, coming from the background of a bit of a larger organisation, really, but at the same time, I think our needs in this space are the same as across many other organisations that end up using the city. So, I mean, really, I work for the campaigns team that did political sort of lobbying as opposed to fundraising. So, I'm covering the Context that we use data to try to secure changes in government policy and NHS policy. And our problem as a team, you go to the next slide, was basically a common problem of having huge amounts of data stored on spreadsheets and access database and various other sources. And this was separated on multiple separate colleagues' workstations and also other regionally based SAR computers. So it wasn't sort of coherent, it wasn't necessarily all kept up to date and that can present issues when you're trying to make a case for change on any particular area. And so we examined a number of solutions, but we also had very minimal or no budget, mainly because 
IT solutions aren't really a, something that my team is very interested in, so there wasn't much appetite for devoting money towards finding a solution in this case, and we stumbled across City CRM as a solution that would cost very little. So yeah, that was the solution we found. And I mean, initially, we sort of put together a city database ourselves, purely just to hold this policy data in one place where it could be backed up and accessed by everyone in one source rather than on their own separate machines. And then realizing the potential of it as a platform, which now sort of moved forward to the holding supported data on it and sort of basically using it as a stakeholder contact database to record our interactions with stakeholders. And it was fairly easy to implement, as in we didn't get in any developer support except for a major version update. I put together the entire sort of uh, customization of the system myself. I guess customization is the wrong word in this context. Our uh, install of the system myself, effectively using one of the web based providers that are around. And it all ran very smoothly. And so moving forward, we're planning, well, it's already being rolled out now across a couple of other teams in the organization. And they're also very happy with using it. And now our major next steps are possible integration with our website that's Drupal based, that's something we're exploring. And possible introduction of web forms that volunteers can interact with directly, which is another useful opportunity that Civi CRO presents. And then the main barrier that we're now facing is sort of ensuring integration with other CRM systems within the organization because we can promise the earth on various other CRM programs that have been running internally for years and none of them have actually reached our team yet, but we still have to exchange data with them. So that's the next step we're exploring in this context. Um, and yeah, we'll roll through that pretty quickly. So I'll pass it on to you. Hi guys, my name's John and I'm the lead developer at Future First. Um, my background is slightly different to a lot of people here in that I started... My my, oh, sorry. Uh, I think you just have to hold it close to your mouth. It is. It was on. Um, uh, my background is slightly different in that I started my career in the games industry, so very, very product focused and very software development focused. Um, and I brought that with me. I brought a lot of the sort of um, approaches and sort of ideals to, to to developing for this small charity um, when I moved there. Um, what Future First does, it is a charity that helps state schools and government funded colleges to make the most of their networks of their former students. Um, and that might be by having them speak in a classroom or fundraise or appear on a poster or become a school governor or provide mentoring or work experience or um, lots and lots of different ways. Um, so we have different elements of our technology. We've got the custom-made teacher dashboard. How many of you were in the lightning talks earlier? Okay, a few. So I so, um, won't spend too much time on that. We have an internal, well, we have a Civi CRM install which does both function. It functions as both our internal CRM and it provides the data that appears in the dashboard. We've got web forms that students can sign up through. Um, and, and like my colleague, we have um, tracking surveys which keep the contacts up to date. Um, it, our dashboard's made out of Drupal and Civi CRM and a lot of customizations on top. Uh, you've seen our search function and our mailbox and our contact deep page already. Um, but to me, sort of the main thing that we've got out of Civi CRM and Drupal is the uh, ability to very flexibly customize and extend our systems so that when teachers discover through engaging their students that they have another requirement that they weren't aware of before, we're able to meet that and we're able to develop our technology to keep up with the, uh, the, the rapidly growing charity and the, the rapidly growing culture change that we're affecting. Thank you. Great, thank you very much guys. So uh, we've got a really diverse, oh, sorry, stand there. Uh, a really diverse uh, range of different organisations and experience levels. Some people have done some, well most people have done things in house, some people, I know that John's had external support as well. Um, so I guess uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll warm everything up uh, with the first question I uh, not demanded before. Um, <laughs> was there any particular single reason for picking Civi over the competition? And I'll throw that at Adam. 
Yeah, just really to uh, reiterate what I said in my, t my speech, it was purely a financial decision. Um, the, the, the point of development of the organisation, we just didn't have enough money to afford any other system. Uh, so it quickly got narrowed down to, to an open source one. Um, I mean, you can kind of uh, go back in history and, uh, and play some other, other decisions on it that you, you would have liked to have been part of it, but it, it wouldn't, wouldn't have match the reality of actually why we decided to use Cilia at the time. Um, I would say, probably, I wasn't actually involved in the selection process uh, to start with, I was just brought into the project a bit later on. Um, as far as selection criteria is concerned, I think quite a lot of it was actually based upon rumour, uh, and it was actually asking other uh, organisations their experiences of actually using different bits of software. Uh, and then there was a selection process, and we did select a computer, and it was on the basis of uh, computers who spoke uh, English to us rather than actually hold our technology. So that was one of the key criteria, basically, of us uh, selecting computer. Um, I think that's all I've got to say on that one. Um, I think there's database solutions that you can acquire for one or two grand or even less. Go, I, I firmly believe Civi CRM is best option available really and also I believe in open source software effects I think it's the direction that charitable organisations should be going is it means you can produce developments that support an entire community of organisations rather than just paying money that's going into the back pocket of a large corporate supplier. Uh, so I was very honoured to be part of the selection process myself, um, it's much the same thing, of it, for us it had to be an open source system so that we could uh, maintain it and develop this dashboard with that, um, but at the same time, sort of to do that privately and to do that with a large software development firm, the cost would have been prohibitive, they couldn't even really consider, so it had to be open source, um, and it was recommended to us by Zane, and it's worked out really well. So I'll throw it open to the floor, uh, are there any questions that anybody has for the team, or? If you if you want to say it out and then we'll um, when I get yeah. the guy to repeat so, it. So question for Adam actually. Uh, you mentioned you were on Excel. Mm. You were able to make some of the new charts with all the things you set up. Uh, it was a mixture of, of yeah. access and Excel. What sort of problems you had doing that? Was it straightforward or, or how long did it take? Um, the, 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 the longest period was cleaning up the data a little bit. Um, you, if you've been using database systems for a while, they tend to have you know, data recorded in the wrong columns, um, uh, addresses that are too long, you know, incomplete postcodes, etc. So that would have been the bit that, that, that took the longest. Uh, once it was there in a proper Excel format, the import of the CSV file was actually relatively easy. And sorry, just one more. Uh, why did you go to Google and not uh, WordPress? Um, at the time, uh, Civi didn't interact with WordPress. That's been a more recent thing. It was Joomla and Drupal at the time. I'll, uh, I'll add two things to that in terms of kind of data migration. Um, so uh, Civi has a uh, built-in data import tool, so it's got a, a CSV import tool, so you can import data, contact, participants at events, membership, all of that kind of stuff yourself. Um, if you're doing a big, large-scale data migration, actually there's another session which will talk about this using uh, there are other open source tools available, uh, one of them we, we kind of use, which is called Tempo, and it allows you to, to do certain things around data. It's also got um, uh, data quality uh, module, basically, that kind of does certain checking, so it can find kind of failed email addresses and like test the email addresses as it kind of processes them to see whether they're up to date and things like that. So it's a data quality. Um, so, and then on the Drupal question as to why uh, some organizations pick Drupal actually more recently, what you'll find actually from a site building perspective is that um, Drupal has better integration with Civi CRM than WordPress and Joomla. So uh, Stephen might be able to give a couple more points on that. But um, so Stephen there on WordPress, um, what they found is that, okay, yes, you can install Civi on WordPress. Um, you can do some of the stuff that you want to, like event sign up and all of those kind of things. Um, however, there are already some ready-made tools on the Drupal platform that allow you to do more about pulling your data out from Civi than there are existing on the WordPress platform. So that's just one of the considerations that if you're looking at a new website, 
generally at the moment people go down the, the Drupal to HDR and really the fast kind of example. There's some other reasons for the architectures kind of more influence. Yeah. Um, I've also got a question concerning Drupal and its CRM. Um, at the moment we're starting uh, to try to introduce a Divi CRM uh, now. Um, we've got it all planned, no first steps taken yet. And at, and at the same time we're start, uh, we have already Website um, is something that should be optimized to be a low latency system. Uh, so the web pages are delivered with the least latency po uh, possible. And um, running C uh, C uh, CVCRM on the same installation as, uh, as Drupal uh, as a showerful uh, a PHP application. Um, I'm always afraid that that could pull down the, uh, the low latency effect of, uh, uh, for the website so that when uh, lots of colleagues are using uh, CVCRM, uh, the, our web pages would come out slowly uh, to our users to just visiting the website. So is it, um, is it no problem to you or is it something where you would wish, okay, we'd like to have different servers for web pages and just give the um, people who use uh, inter interfaces with CVCRM uh, to another server uh, that can uh, better handle those uh, longer term stuff. Um, you yes. guys all right if I cover this? Or yeah. do you, do you yeah. I'll so <laughs> so just repeat the question for the, uh, for the base of the camera, which is kind of about the performance impact of having CIVI on kind of a, um, a high volume, maybe Drupal side. Um, and um, the answer is CIVI, is, CIVI is quite big and it is quite complex. Um, there are different architectural decisions that you can make in order to mitigate that if you are specifically concerned about uh, performance impact. Um, I think that the organisations here at the moment would probably say that um, you know, massive amounts of page views isn't a, a huge issue that you're hitting at the moment. I'd um, love to have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, but you can look at things, so for, for example, you can host your Civi database separate from the Drupal database, so they can be on separate physical servers, um, so they could therefore all have uh, less of a performance impact on hitting. Um, you can also look at uh, caching options, so like Varnish or something like that on the Drupal side, which will speed up any um, static pages, so that will keep something separate as well. Um, so, and then there's different performance tuning that you can do around kind of the, the database level, so there's also Memcached and other things like that that you can look at. So there, there are things, it is a consideration though, um, in terms of performance across the board, and then the, the pages on the website which might be calling bits from Drupal, you might want to look specifically at those in order to kind of optimise them better, or whether or not you can put in place some actual other caching that's um, like the folk that you needed. James, can I add to that? Uh, yeah. So, uh, in my experience, um, what we, the time when we've experienced problems with, with slowness um, hasn't been to do with the number of people hitting the website at once. In our experience, it was where things like um, a report had been used inappropriately um, and was being loaded on each page or something. Um, and to me, it's all about the, to me, it's all about how the site's configured and set up. Using, using Drupal in itself isn't going to give you a slow website. Um, just set up yeah, John brings up a good point there, which is about reporting, which is that if you've got um, significant reporting needs as well, um, it's something to consider about maybe um, replicating um, the databases and then running the reports against a separate database. But this is all getting a bit technical, we can chat about it a bit more a bit later. Um, any more questions? Oh, yeah, one. Um, can I just ask? I should point out that this isn't supposed to be a coffee call session, but yeah, so, <laughs> but, yeah, so I just happened to ask my clients to come up well, except for Matt. Um, so over to you. Uh, we were initially with another organisation. Um, we came to CompuCore a couple of years ago when we had a 
particular issue that we wanted to solve, we went around to a number of different organisations and I'd echo what the, uh, 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 my colleague here says, that um, uh, they spoke English to us and they gave us you know, a clear idea of how much it was going to cost, what they were going to do around it. And um, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a good relationship since. Um, as far as the Association of Charities is concerned, it was the selection of uh, or guidance around software first and then supplier selection afterwards. So it was basically based on asking other organisations first about their experiences of bits of software, finding one that people seem to like, and then finding a supplier for that particular piece of software. I, yeah, actually just sort of used one of the one click install city CRM hosting sort of providers and put together the whole database myself. It, it's fairly easy to customize. You don't need to know how to code or anything to put together a city CRM database. It's that easy really at the front end. And then moving forward, I now do have a support contract with the hosting provider, mainly just for the major version revisions and security updates, which are a bit more technical to implement, I think. But it very much can be sort of put together by someone as an organization with some knowledge of databases, but not a huge amount of technical experience. So Future First doesn't have any official partnership with company called, sorry, sorry Future second. First International does but not be part of Future First that I work for. Um, so, but I mean, but I, I know of company called through, through their involvement in, in hosting the meetups and in hosting the sort of community side of it, which is completely invaluable to me as a developer and an administrator. Yeah, I just add that, I mean, in terms of from our experience, um, there's been, um, you can, what I would say is that you can have good uh, CRM implementations on nearly all platforms, and you can have bad CRM implementations on nearly all platforms. Um, and, you know, there's, there's going to be lots of different factors involved in that. Um, but one of the big ones is actually around the organisation and how they take to a CRM um, and how um, they feel about CRM. So. One of the things I would say is that um, taking that decision out to the organisation and getting lots of engagement with them in terms of what you're going to be deciding to use, getting their feedback in that early on um, significantly improves the chances of you know, having a successful implementation rather than something that, um, hey, we picked this and therefore you guys are going to use it. Uh, that tends to be a lot harder. And no matter which CRM platform that you use, um, that tends to spell you know, kind of difficulty. Um, what I have found though is that for, for us, most people have already decided upon Civi to a certain extent and gone through that exercise internally. So they're kind of saying, right, everybody's engaged here to do Civi, and then you know that that, um, that implementation is going to be successful. Whereas if it wasn't like that, we'd tend to try and steer, steer away from it. Cool. Uh, any more questions? Yep, one at the front there. Um, a really broad question. Is there anything that you know now that you Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I guess I wish I'd knew, known how long the Drupal stuff would have taken us. Um, it, it's, it's always an interesting thing. I think whenever you outsource anything as an organisation, um, when I advise other organisations, not just in IT, but right across the board, bad outsourcing happens because they don't know enough about whatever it is they're outsourcing. So there is an advantage from an organisation doing things themselves um, that you learn enough to be able to outsource things properly. And I would say that initially we didn't know enough to be able to outsource it properly. I think over the years, um, although it's, it, we, we put a lot more time into it internally than we, we ever intended to, um, and if you were doing it purely from a project management perspective, you might say that was a bad thing, but actually in the long run, uh, that kind of organizational knowledge has been very useful for us. And it's also then become a source of competitive advantage over some of the other organisations that operate in the same space as us, because uh, we know a lot more what the technology is capable of doing, and we know a lot more what we want out of it, so that we can very effectively outsource things, um, and say, you know, we want this little extension, you know, we kind of tapped into the community a lot more. Um, so, yes, I wish I'd known, if I'd known at the beginning how long some of it would have taken me, I might not have made the decision I did. But then when I came out the other side of that process, that some of those 
the things that took me so long to work out are actually very valuable sources of information. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> uh, I think the key thing from the Association of Chairs' point of view is um, it's probably actually too soon for us to make this move because we're quite a small organisation and actually we do not need some of the complexity that is actually in city CRM. And apart from that, the organisation is less than a year old. So asking users about the requirements at this stage is a bit like asking a six-year-old what they want to be when they grow up. I mean, you get all sorts of, you know, we could do this, we could do that. So I think the, the business environment needs to be more stable to actually get a stable set of requirements out of them. So we're probably a year ahead of where we probably should be. Um, not so much things I wish I'd known. I kind of wish I'd involved a corporate IT team a bit more a bit earlier on because I'm just the sort of person that those departments hate and I kind of secured <laughs> minimal buy-in from them and then went in head and did what I needed to do anyway and having to deal with some fallout from that now. But it's not the end of the world for anyone involved. <laughs> Um, I think there are two things because um, because the, my organisation was already using Civi before I arrived. I think there's, there's two dimensions to that question: is what would I do differently, and what do I wish the organisation had done differently? Um, and what happened with us is one team took the it's the team that does the liaising with the schools and the liaising with the uh, with a lot of the alumni really took the. Civi CRM and ran with it, and it sort of almost in a way became much more an extension of their team, whereas the team that did the events delivery and management was still very much using spreadsheets, and unfortunately that means that there is data which is not connected to anything, and it is it is poss very possibly going to be lost, you know, it's a big shame even though we can um, import it. Some, some, there's going to be some attrition, there's going to be some stuff that we can't use. Um, so I think from an organisational perspective, even though now everyone's on Civi and they've all had Civi trained, they're all on board, um, they all see the potential of it. I think organisationally I wish that would be something that had happened sooner. Um, from my own point of view, I, I come to a slightly different angle as a developer. I wish that I'd um, researched uh, the API and the, and the possibilities of Drupal a lot more. Because although Civi is very powerful, so is Drupal, and I joined the organisation with no um, serious experience of either. So, as well as sort of learning what um, Civi can do, I, it's also worth investing the time to see what else is out there in the communities of whichever content management system you've chosen. Um, I'd just add, um, it's probably worth for, for some organisations thinking about um, how you can implement, uh, I think the, the phrase is, you know, don't, don't run before you can walk. Um, so, you know, getting to understand the system and spending some time to get around it. So don't rush in and say, right, we need to do absolutely everything from the get-go. One of the great things with Civi is that, you know, you're not kind of paying per module. It's not like you, you don't have it all there, um, but you can switch bits of it off as you kind of need them. Uh, so sometimes doing something simple and getting that embedded in the organisation as a CRM before kind of saying, oh, okay, now we need to integrate everything into our website or now we need to make every single sign-up form be online. Um, sometimes it's better to kind of get a feel, get people kind of trained up in using it, and then it can be a lot more organic, and things tend to go a lot more smoothly like that. I think that would be the case for any CRM as well. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, question for you, Jim. Um, when you get a version 4.3 of Civi, how, how do you... An organization which has 4.3. How do you move into a different version to be able to? I just don't understand the mechanism of how you do that. I'll let John answer this up. <laughs> yeah. King of upgrades. So, um, not that long ago, Jamie asked me to do a presentation and came up with the name Upgrading Your Upgrade. Is that it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we, for Future First, it is very complex because we have so much custom things. Do you have custom modules and custom extensions and stuff? You do. Okay, so um, the, the first thing to do, I think, is to do a complete assessment of what your customizations are. And unfortunately, that does mean um, going through the different files, comparing it to your baseline version, and then but documenting it as you go along. And documenting thoroughly now will also make the next upgrades that you have to do easier. Um, the, the, the second thing is that I, in the second main thing that I learned from doing that was 
because we upgraded from 4.2 to 4.4. Uh, it was it was a large upgrade all at once, but it, it went really well actually. We didn't have any serious issues with it at all, um, and we had sort of dozens of custom extensions of modules, um, possibly two dozen, but between yeah, one and two dozen. dozen. Yeah. Um, and we and and yeah, it went well. But the other thing that I'd say is test everything all at once, because what I would do is I would test something, find if there was a slight issue, um, and then sort of fix that issue, and then test another part, and then fix that, and actually it, that meant that the organisation just didn't know when it was coming on, should have done a full assessment all at once, and then I'd have been better able to do the fixing, um, the updating of the various bits. But there's another part to this, which is that if you are developing your own in-house things, you can save yourself a lot of time with the upgrades by doing it, by doing it properly. And you do your customizations, and that just means documentation, and it means using the API wherever you can. So each time there's an upgrade, you go through the same process. E each time there's an upgrade, you do go through the process, yes, but it becomes easier and easier each time if you develop with that in mind, and if you document thoroughly as you go along. Oh, and uh, automated testing and unit tests uh, are really, um, really, really important. I'll just caveat that by saying, if, if, you, if you have an out-of-the-box Civi installation, um, then an upgrade process is actually quite a simple process. So a new version gets available up online, and you can just upgrade to that version. So the situation that John's talking about is a situation where you've decided to do lots of bespoke modifications. I think John, um, John's particular instance, some of those modifications were quite legacy. They've been around since version 4.1, or maybe even earlier than that. Um, and so they were written using slightly older technology or approaches. Um, now things are a lot easier if you want to create um, extensions that are uh, generally, uh, you know, kind of upgrade safe because they use parts of the system that aren't changing when you upgrade. So that's something that you know, as developers, we kind of keep in mind. Also, there's a lot of uh, community contributed extensions as well, and generally, once they're community contributed, they're maintained. So you know that when you move to the new version, you can have a look and say, oh, well, I'm using the Civi discount module, or that one's well maintained, and therefore, if, when I move up to 4.5, you can just check and say, oh, it has been updated to 4.5, great, I'll just upgrade that one as well. So you can keep everything in sync. So, you know, it's, it's about whether or not you're really customizing things. Does anybody have anything to add? Uh, cool, any more questions? So I think we're, we're, we're out of time. So I just want to say thank you very much for everybody on the panel. And I think they'd be happy, as would I, if you have any questions or anything else comes up, just uh, give us a tap on the shoulder. Cheers, guys. Thanks.